to participate. You don't have to participate in this if you don't want to. Is there a cutoff for the number of partners that your mate would have for you to say, I, I can't date you? If there isn't, just say there, there, it doesn't matter to me. That, that bears no relevance. If there is, state that number around what you think within, I don't know, five or ten or something, whatever. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah, I got confused. What did you think I said? Never mind. But you understand it, right? Okay. Welcome. Okay, so get out a piece of paper. Uh, don't put your name on these. Again, I don't want to see your name. If you put your name on it, cross it off. I don't want to see your name. I don't want any identifying information. Take out a piece of paper. Write your, the sex that you identify with, number one, but don't put your name on it. I don't want to see your name. Number two, the sex that you're attracted to. And then three, if there, if, assuming you're single, if there was, and you want, you're interested in somebody, is there a number of sexual partners that that person would have where you would say, this is a deal breaker now, it's too many, you went too high. If there isn't, right, it doesn't matter. Uh, if there is, write down what you think that number is roughly. Roughly, yes. This is hypothetical. This is hype. It's not about a specific person or anything like that. It's very hypothetical. Okay. So obviously, if you're in a relationship, then then it wouldn't make any sense to to even answer this question. But um, assuming hypothetically, and you don't have to participate in this. Okay. Does everyone everyone do this? Who wants to participate? Okay. Pass them up, and we're going to tally them. We're going to tally them up here. Again, you don't have to do. You don't have to participate. You don't have to do this. Okay, and I'm just gonna. This is this is not. This isn't a. Re, this is actually. That's a great question. It's a great question. So if this is a if this is a, a research study that was going to be published, I would have to. But since this is a classroom activity, I don't need to. But that's a really good point to bring up. It's a good point. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Wait. Can I have a, uh, an administrative assistant? Can someone help me? Thank you. Not you. Okay, anyone else? I can't have an administrative assistant. Jeez. Extra credit? No, I guess I'll just do it. Okay. All right. Um, so what do you guys think? So let's talk about this as an activity before we uh, I tally these. Um, first of all, here's a sign-in sheet. Um, whoops, sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, okay. Okay. All right. What do you guys think? Um, is there should there be a cutoff? What do you guys think? Or, or yeah. Well, your hand went straight up. Okay. It, all right. Well, it depends on the person necessarily. I mean, okay. Well, yeah. Of course it does. Of course. If you have somebody who doesn't wrap up and is like sleeping around, then it's very dangerous to point at the guys. You know? Wrap up? You mean? Wear yeah. a condom. Yeah. Yes. Use okay. Protection. Yes. Right. Okay. So, okay. That's okay. But we're adults here. Yeah. But then if you have somebody who's very smart and like right. smart about uses protection and right. tends to you know have some fun, then it's like okay, I can see they have a lot more sexual partners. In other words, there's a, a concern about diseases and yeah, whatnot. So then if you're you're protective, then what difference does it make how many partners they have? Okay. So there's a logicality there. Okay. What were you gonna say? Um, stigmatization. Okay. Think, I don't think that a a lot of females would give you the accurate number. So that's why I said, I did, yeah, right, right. So that's, that's why I didn't want, I, I was going to do this, like, raise your hands, and I was like, I'm going to get a really bad result that way. I guess the juxtaposition to that, just suppose that the males, males seem to always lie, and while how many females they, so, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's one of those type of bills there. Okay. Like, uh, don't ask, don't tell type of thing. Okay, okay. Um, anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. I was about to not participate because, like, I don't know. Like, in my religion, it's more, um, mm -hmm. like, bringing to a marriage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In many religions, it's that way, yeah, yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some people are forced to do more. Sure. Yeah. So, I don't know. I feel like it's also that goes into the question. How could it not? It depends on how much you have. It is very individual. And, of course, context matters as well, doesn't it? Of course, yeah. Anyone else? Else? Okay, what do you think now? What do you what do you predict some of these answers are going to be like? Yes. I would assume it doesn't matter how much a person is going to do with their good and they change or whatever, it doesn't matter. 
Okay, I haven't looked at any. I looked at like one or two of these. So, so you think most of them are going to say most people are going to say it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, you're going to say most people are going to say it doesn't matter. Okay, anyone else? Any other predictions? Yes, anyone? Any predictions? I have no idea what these results are. We're going to tell you. Yeah. So you're saying that females would say that it doesn't matter how many yeah. sexual partners their guy had, but a guy would say that you had too many sexual partners. Okay. I, I think you're probably right about that. That's, that's a, a, I think that's a fair prediction. It might not be a, a just or an ethical one, but, but that's you, probably, you might be right. You might be right. Let's, let's see. Uh, so um, how should we tally this? Uh, any suggestions? So we have... But we have male, female to male and the male to female. We have that so too. Male. Okay, so we'll do, can someone do this and then I'll call it up. Can someone help me? Thank you. Thanks. This will be way easier. Okay, so first one, I don't know how you want to write yeah, it. Like, okay. Yeah, right? Um, so the first person is female. I am female. You're going to have to press darker. I, I'm not, I, cannot, I can't see that at all. Like, can you push it a little bit harder? Okay. Just put that... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, it was so foreboding. <laughs> um, and then this person is attracted to males. Okay. And this person, the cutoff is one. This person said if you had sex with more than one person, that is too much. <laughs> Did you? How do you know that's yours? Because I, well, one of mine, because I interpreted the question. Oh. I thought it was Are you sure this is yours? Oh, no. See, you don't know. <laughs> Why don't we just go through all of this? Why don't we go through all of this? Um, so that's that's one. So one was the cutoff for this person. More than one. They, they would say no. Okay. The next one, we're going to see what these results are here. Um, the next one is a male. And this person says, I'm attracted to females. And this person said, no, it doesn't matter. So how are we going to write this down? So maybe... Maybe I'll just put it yeah, none. Okay, so we're going to have maybe four different ones. Let, let's see how this works out. I don't know how this works. We're going to gather these. Okay, all right. The next one is, uh, this person is a female. Um, okay, and this one is attracted to males. And this one says two or more would be the cutoff. Two, two. So if, if this person met a guy who had sex with three women, he'd be like, see ya. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, next one. Um, this one is a female. Is attracted to males. And it doesn't matter. What a, what a variety already, huh? One, two, and two that it doesn't matter, huh? Yeah? Let's, let, let's, we have a bunch more. We have a whole bunch. Let's see what we got here. Um, uh, this person is female, is attracted to males, and four. Uh, this one is male, and attracted to females, and I think this is either an eight or an infinity number. I can't <laughs> tell. Let's go with eight. I think this is an eight. <laughs> okay. Um, this person did not write if they were male or female, they just wrote five. So just put five down. They wrote, depends on the age. Um, so let's just have a five there. Um, we might have to throw that piece of data out. This is a, oh, here we go. Um, this person is female, attracted to males, and has five. Five is a cutoff. Okay. Um, this person is male, attracted to females, and said 20 is too many. But 19, that's all right. <laughs> Just kidding. We're just getting a rough idea here. This person is, wow, this person is female, is attracted to males, and said if, if that guy slept with 60 or more, that would be a, the cutoff. 60. 60. 60. 6 zero. Okay. This person. Um, hi, John. Yes, sure. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Um, did someone take over? Actually, this means I'll it. Okay. So I was 
Yeah, yeah, true, because it's like not just like time yeah. 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 person. Yeah. 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 No, and then imagine, yeah, imagine yeah. the amount yeah. of times yeah. that they yeah. 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 do shit. Yeah, right. It's, it's crazy. They yeah. get it because yeah. of the person, yeah. 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 you know? Yeah. And that's not the time you find the time to just have like the first thing, second thing. It's just part of your picture. What can I do to do that? Because I have to do that. That's why I thought it was my love. <laughs> I'm interested to your point of view. What's your point of view? It's definitely not a Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for waiting. Okay. Um, this person is male and is attracted to females. And said if that person slept with more than one, it'd be too much. Um, this person is female and attracted to males. And said if that. If that if that male slept with two, it would be too much. But said preferably none. This person values male virginity apparently. Okay, interesting. Okay, I don't know what you put two. Two is good. Yeah, put two is good. Yeah. This person is male, prefers females, and said ten would be too many. Okay. Um, this person is female, attracted to males, and said I don't know. So this is this is one we're going to have to not. It's no data there. Um, this one says male attracted to female, and it doesn't matter. Interesting. This person is female attracted to men, and said only one. Wow, these are almost the reverse of what I would expect, like almost 180% diametrically opposite. This person is female, and is uh, attracted to both males and females, and said it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, this person is male, attracted to females, and said eight. Eight was a cutoff. Um, this one is male, and attracted to females, and said fifteen is the cutoff. This last one is male, attracted to females. These are almost the opposite of what a lot of literature say. By the way, um, this one's male, attracted to females, and said seven is a cutoff. Okay. So small sample. It is a very small it's a very small sample size. Yeah. We can't draw conclusions from this. Uh, that's a great point. But what does it I can't really see. What does it look like from over there? What are you seeing? Very unreliable. It's unreliable, it's yeah. Unreliable. It's all over very the place. Negatively skewed. It's it almost seems like women am I am I the only one to look like it looks like like females <laughs> prefer the number to be lower than the men. <laughs> does it not look like that to you a little bit? Which is the opposite of what I would I predicted, and a lot of the studies show the opposite that men seem to. Um, well, wait a minute. That's kind of interesting, though. What do you What do you think about that? What is does Do you think it really doesn't matter? Is this just all just socially constructed stuff, or does it matter somehow? What do you think? Does it matter how many partners your partner has or has had for your future health of your relationship? Yeah. I gotta close this, sorry. As far as like maybe what they're looking for in a mate, like, like okay. what you're saying about long term or short term. Right, that's important. Right. I think that maybe some of these might be long term strategies, maybe instead of like short term. This was supposed to be long term, yeah. So if it was if you're looking for Mr. Right or Mr. Right now, it depends. Like if you're if you're looking for someone for a short term mating strategy. It probably wouldn't matter if they had many, many partners as opposed to a long-term strategy. That might be different. It might be different, and it usually is. Um, so uh, what – anyone else? Anyone else? So what about that? So say, let's say that you're looking for a long-term strategy, a long-term mate, and you find out the number of, of partners that person has had. Does that play any bearing in your decision to continue pursuing this person? 
not maybe you personally, but in general? What do you think the average person might not just think, but what might be the, the advantage of, of, of pursuing one of these strategies or not? Or if you follow my meaning, you had kind of went one of those. I think it could change your perspective or how you see the person. Um, now we um, usually say that it shouldn't matter because that's a person's uh, right, a person's choice. You can do whatever you want. But see, that's the that's the catch too. So that's why I, I like to think, or I like my philosophy is don't ask questions to answer you might not like. So <laughs> don't know, ask, don't tell. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so if you're a guy, you're not gonna like it if it's two or three. I mean, if you if you if you possess a type of guy, so I'd rather just like you know not know and just keep her ass. Pass. Just have the you have your fantasy of her in your head, and that's good you know, enough. No, it's my fantasy because I like to deal in reality. But I'm saying she had a life before you, so you know you don't want to dig in her closet and dig up her skeletons because you might not like what you find. It's true. It's true. Igno- so ignorance is bliss. One hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's hard to argue against that. Okay. What do you got to say? I think the delivery is really important too. So the delivery. What do you mean? Yeah. Like so. So I knew this one girl who was Uh-oh. very Here open, we go. And very open about her. Don't say name. No, no, no. Okay. She's uh, very open about her sex life. Okay. And uh, I don't know. That to me was kind of like, like that's cool. That's what you do. You go to parties, like you have mm-hmm. a couple drinks, like you have a couple one night stands. Like that's okay. cool. It's it's all good for the short term. It's her choice. Long, but yeah. like my perception of her kind of like changed. A little it bit. did. It's like, Okay. Like, that's really what you do. That, that's what uh, Oswego State is like. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so we hear this. So, so some people might say that that might be sexist. Now, I'm not saying that, but some people might say that. I'm sure you, you're probably aware of that. Now, why would some people get offended by that, do you think? Now, I'm not at all. I don't care. Um, but some people might say that, of course, you know, it's her choice. Anyone yeah, can have as many partners. It's a female as opposed to a male. Mm-hmm. Because if the male did it, then it would be like, oh, boy. Right, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. Why is it like hoorah when the male does it? And we say when the female does it, we go, oh, you, you had too many partners, or that's somehow wrong, or something like that. Well, I've had people the same way who had just even more, but it's, all, but it's kind of like, oh, like, you know, that's just like a pastime thing, whatever. Like, right. more serious people like that person just because of like the whole like partying, drinking, or like don't care about this, don't care about that. Right. Out there. Right. That's more like unattractive than a girl who's like, yeah, I've done this, but like I also have my shit together. So. And that's, so he's saying it's more attractive, and, and, and a lot of people think that. Why would that be considered? Now, you might not think that personally, but if you do, if you don't, it's okay. But why might that be considered more attractive to some people? Why is it that in many cultures, the virgin bride is valued, but in those same cultures, the virgin groom it's almost a joke. It's not a valued thing in that culture. And we say these are social constructs. And yeah, of course, they are socially constructed, but why do those social constructs exist? Why are virgin brides valued, but virgin grooms, it doesn't even, there's no, that phrase doesn't even exist. It's not even a thing. Why is that? Why would that be? So we have some new inventions. We have the birth control pill that came around that kind of flipped things on its head, evolutionarily speaking, and changed female choices completely. Okay? So, and in some ways, this has empowered a lot of women. But in many ways, um, as we'll see, uh, males' choices and males' preference for chastity in women changed after the advent of birth control pills. Um, so um, let's keep that in mind. And then I'm going to give out a quiz not graded, just for you. Um, we're going to go over this, and then we're going to start the PowerPoint after we go over this quiz, okay? Um, so I'm going to hand this out, and then there's a couple on here we didn't really go over too well, um, but just do the best you can, and we'll, we'll go through them. Um, and probably coming around there. Here we go. Moving around. Um, they skipped you, huh?
Um, the 6th, um, November 6th, the rough draft is due. The rough draft for the term paper is due on, on November 6th, which is also the day of the exam. Just to FYI, now you're, some of you are looking at me like you're giving me the... It's also voting day. Um, try to vote before you come to class if you want to vote. Um, so the rough draft, uh, basically what I'm looking for is to pick a topic in evolutionary psychology and compare it to the standard social science model. So whatever the topic is, whether it's aggression, um, long-term strategies, short-term strategies, um, whatever it may be, uh, uh, taste aversions, uh, uh, anything, violence, any, and any topic, pick it and compare and contrast that topic to the standard social science model version of the explanation of whatever that topic is. So the whole point of this class is that uh, one of the main topics is that the standard social science model talks a lot about how everything is a social construct. But the whole point of this paper is to juxtapose that to an evolutionary explanation to it. So I'm looking for that paper to talk about whatever topic it is, comparing a biological explanation to a, a social science explanation. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll post a, a little bit more about it um, uh, uh, this evening. Um, and, and there'll be, yeah. And the terms also due? Yeah, so there's going to be a lot due. There's a lot due on there. Maybe we should, uh, should we push that one day? Let's, let's move the term paper. Can we move it up a week? Because that is a lot, isn't it? That's a ton. Um, yeah, let's do it a week. Yeah, a week is good. Let's do that. Let's let's make it the thirteenth. Let's move it up. Yeah, push it back to November thirteenth. Push it up. Push it up. Up back. How do you back? No up. Up down. Push it. Uh, whatever. It's going to be on the thirteenth, not the sixth. Whatever it is. The rough draft. The rough draft. Right. Four to six pages. I'm looking for. Not. Yeah, not including the cover and the uh, title page or the, the, the okay. references or anything like that. Four to six pages. If you write three to four, that's okay, but just try to get as much as you can. Okay? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll write more about that a little bit. Um, okay, uh, something else. Oh, the, the exam is supposed to be on chapters four, five, and six, but I'm saying j let's just have it on uh, chapters four and five. Okay, so the exam is still going to be on the 6th of, of November, and instead of it being 4, 5, and 6, it's just 4 and 5. The final exam is still going to be on the last day of class. That's going to include 6 and whatever else is on there. Okay, does that make sense? So okay. you just want to turn to 4 and 5? Or... Just 4 and 5, just 4 and 5, yes, please, yes, yes. Um, okay, so uh, number 1. Um, Let's see, where are we? Okay, number one, males have uh, what kind of gametes and usually uh, make the what parental investment? Smaller, smaller. Smaller gametes and smaller parental investment. Yes, C is, is the first one, C. Uh, two, wherever a female shows a mating preference, the male's blank is or are often the key selection criteria. Someone else, what is it? Number two. Resources. Resources, yes, it's very. Say it again. It's, it's not a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. It might be. I don't know. Let's see. Three. Women on average prefer as mates uh, as who are blank than they are. Older. I guess it is preseason in a row. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I didn't plan it that way. I promise. Um, the emotion of love is what? Yes. <laughs> this is four C's. Um, it is found cross-culturally. Is that the best answer here? Yes, C. Yeah, four C's in a row. Now. Now it's a conspiracy. Five. Um, we didn't really talk about this, would but... Be, would it be D, though? Like, if you're talking about, like, range matters, it's maybe... Which one? For four. Maybe. For four. Like, for range matters, it's maybe, like, it doesn't necessarily have to have a level. Right. So if we look at... So there was that one study that they looked at Pakistanis and, and uh, Chinese and Americans, and when they asked, is love an important thing, and they many of them said no in a range cultures. Definitely. That's, that's not a criteria. But it's a physiological reaction. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's found cross-culturally. Um, so the idea is that this, this love is not just something that, you know, like Hollywood invented to, like, like brainwash us. It's, it's something that's biological that, that all people in all cultures do. Um, 
Okay, five, Bakweri women, which we didn't talk much about. Uh, I think I just, we didn't really, this was related to something, but um, the Bakweri, uh, women in the Bakweri uh, uh, tribe, they have about as much, or in some cases, more resources than the men in Bakweri culture, okay? So knowing that, so Bakweri women have uh, sometimes really more resources than the men do in Bakweri culture. What would you predict? Bakweri women's mate preferences cast doubt on what, what theory? Yeah. Uh, it is, D is the correct answer, structural powerlessness. So let's talk a little bit about that, because what, what was a structural powerlessness hypothesis? What is that? Who remembers what that is? Who remembers what that is? So what's the explanation in the standard social science model? So we know that, that women typically make less than men. Okay? We know this in society. What then is the explanation that the standard social science model explains this as? Why is it that women make less money than men do? What, what are you told in all of your other classes? What's the reason why? What is it? The patriarchy. The patriarchy. It keeps women oppressed and it keeps them down in a, in a position of powerlessness, and that's why they seek men with more resources. That's the standard social science explanation. Uh, but the back wary women, if that's true, if the reason why women seek men with more resources is because men are keeping them down in a position of powerlessness, then in situations where women make as much or more than men, then they shouldn't be marrying up. They should be marrying men who make less money than they do. Do you see that happening? No, you don't at all. In fact, in some cultures and societies and contexts where women make a lot of money, a ton of money, those women, not only do they not marry uh, poorer guys or guys who make as much, they prefer men who make even more than they do. It, they keep going up. Males do not have this preference. They do not behave that way. Women do. Um, the, powerless, the, the structural powerlessness hypothesis is, is largely... Uh, not true at all. Um, it's that's that's not. Men are not maniacally rubbing their knuckles like how can we control women? Um, not any more than women are trying to do that to men, and they're certainly not doing it uh, through resources. There's laws to prevent this, um, but it's something we hear often. What about six? Which of the following is an adaptive benefit that would not have accrued to ancestral men willing to make a commitment to a partner? Which one's the best one here? Yeah. Increasing. Uh, they would get social allies, though. Yeah, yeah. You got to read it carefully. B is the correct answer. But the reason why I was confused about that was why. Because, um, how? Why would you? Why would increasing paternity uncertainty be an adaptive benefit? It isn't. That's why it is the correct answer. Read the question carefully. Not. Not. Yeah. That's why. Pater they want to increase paternity certainty, but it says paternity uncertainty. Which one is not one? So it would be B. B, that's the correct answer, right? Um, does it make sense? So marrying marrying a woman who has a lot of family, that's that's always a good thing. Uh, well, not always, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> that could be a bad thing, too. But it's generally a good thing. Seven, uh, men in their 50s who are looking for a long-term mate prefer women in their 30s. Men's preferences for short-term mates, however, remain for women uh, at the age peak of fertility. Why might this be? Why might this be? What's the number? Of, what would he put for seven? You guys put for seven. A. a uh, older men may have difficulty attracting dramatically younger women as long-term mates is correct. Yeah, A. Might be, uh, there's very low homogamy, very low, very low similarity. There. Um, okay, eight. Uh, when asked to select the ideal figure for themselves, women selected one blank than men prefer for mates? Thinner, yes. They, women think that men prefer women to be much thinner than men actually prefer. Um, yeah, that's right. Good. Uh, hand? Dana, is that a hand? Can't tell. Okay. They selected one thinner than men prefer for me. Oh, yeah. No, the, the, they're at this. No, the women gave what they think. I guess that, yeah, what they think that, that the men want. Right, exactly. Yeah. No, these are heterosexual women. 
Yeah, they're, they're asking what the heterosexual women think that the men prefer. And those women, usu women usually think men prefer women to be much thinner than, than men actually prefer them. Um, okay, nine, women with low waist to hip ratio and relatively large breasts, uh, which one is true here? Which one is true? B. B, have higher levels of estradiol. Um, having high levels of estrogen or estradiol, uh, there's a lesser chance of miscarriage. There's a greater chance of pregnancy being carried to term. Um, all of these have uh, good selective benefits. Um, the value uh, 10, the value of North American men place on virginity in prospective long-term mates has what over the past half century is what? You probably guess this. What is it? Decrease is the correct answer. It's decrease over the last past half, half century. Since the time of the invention of the birth control pill, almost right that year, men don't care about virginity that much as they used to. It has decreased. They valued it less and less. Um, what does that do for women then? Say, go on and have yourself a ball or whatever. That's essentially the message that's giving out there. Um, so keeping that in mind, let's talk about a few things here. Um, okay, so any questions about the quiz? Or anyone not get one who came in late? There's, there's a stack right here. Uh, make sure you grab one. Um, you're welcome. Okay. Um, all right, when we talk about the patriarchy, we're talking about a lot of bad stuff, okay? A lot of murder, a lot of sexual assault and things that, that women and, and men are really trying to avoid uh, and lessen. Um, so when we think about the patriarchy, what we're actually thinking about is what makes the patriarchy? Um, these are basically things that men are trying to get because they know what women's preferences are. What are some of the things that women prefer in a long-term mate? Money is one thing. Resources, these are the main things. If women prefer resources in a long-term mate, what are you going to see men trying to do? Get resources. And so the war, the conflict, the suicide, the competition, all this stuff is men trying to do something to get the things that they see the women they want, want. That's what competition is. This isn't just in humans. This is in all animals. We're animals. This is, and it's what you would predict, and it's what you see. Um, men, uh, uh, most of the most difficult jobs and dangerous jobs in the world are done by men. They're not done by women. Um, when we say when we say we want women, we want equal employment for women. They don't mean all jobs. They mean CEO jobs and jobs that pay really nice money. When they say they want uh, women, uh, equal number of women and men in jobs, they're not talking about construction jobs or digging ditches or paving roads. They're talking about really nice cush jobs that pay a lot of money. Those really tough jobs where people die on the jobs, women who want equal representation, they don't want those jobs. Most women don't want them. Why? It's not just cultural constructs, because ancestral women who chose dangerous jobs, they probably, if they were pregnant, they would have died. The chances of them dying would have gone up. This, this sounds like benevolent. You know what benevolent sexism is? What's benevolent sexism? What's, what's, you know what benevolence is? Hostile sexism. We know what hostile sexism is. That's, we know that. What is benevolent? Benevolent sexism. When someone says, you're too beautiful and dainty to get your hands dirty. Let me do that for you. A woman shouldn't be doing that because that's so hard to do. Because women should be delicate and be clean and pristine, and so I should do this for you. That's, that's benevolent sexism. You're too special and fragile to do this yourself, and you need a strong man to do that. And that's considered benevolent sexism. Other women prefer that. They like that. Though. Consider that chivalry. Some people might just consider it chivalry. Okay. So there's some, there was actually a study done where um, uh, the idea of holding the door open for a woman seems like a good idea. It's chivalrous. And there was a study done two years ago where they found out men who hold the door open for women are more likely to be misogynists. They're more likely to hate women. Yeah, it makes no sense. Right, exactly. Why don't you just 
No, I'm not saying what you or anyone should do. I'm not, believe me, I don't want to be in that department. I'm not talking, but isn't that kind of weird, though? In this study, they, they found that men who hold the door open for women are more likely to hate women than... Great question. I don't know. It's, it's kind of curious. Yeah, right? Like, what? Yale. This was done at Yale. This was done at Yale University. I, I, that I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So that doesn't mean, yeah, that that's one study. It doesn't conclude anything, obviously. Um, but it, it's kind of interesting, though. So we do know what benevolent sexism is. It's not a fake thing. It's not a fake thing. So if someone says, if a man says, here, let me do this for you, women like that. But then sometimes they could say, someone would say, I don't need you to do that for me. I could do it myself. Then that, now we're going to benevolent sexism. And where exactly is that line? Scientists try to understand that. In that one study, they found that Holding the door, and I don't, I hold doors for open for people all the time. I don't, I don't think that that's a reflection of me or anyone here. But in, according to this one study, guys who would do that had more negative views towards women, it, as it turned out. I don't know exactly how they determined this. Um, so that doesn't mean you shouldn't hold a door open for women. Uh, please do. I, that's, that's my recommendation. But that's an, what does that study mean? What does that say to you? What does that say? How so? What do you mean? What theory? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, well, it's structural. What theory? What do you mean? I, I'm, I don't know how to word it. I just kind of like blurted it out. John, what do you got? No, no. Oh. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. Because correlate, you know, there might be a correlation, but... And what, yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. There's no causation in that, so I mean... Right. I, I thought that was always being like being a gentleman. I never thought of it. Yeah. You yeah. had... Um, Let's see if we could just pull this up. Let's see if we could just pull it up here. Um, let's see. Uh, men hold door open. Uh, um, here. This is in Cosmo. Wait a minute. Daily Mail. So Daily Mail, Huffington Post. Here we go. Price of chivalry. Is it detrimental to women's advancement? So this is like if you have, like, like one time I was in a, I went to the Brooklyn Library and there was a guy who was in a wheelchair and he was in the bathroom. And I went to the bathroom and he was there and I said to myself, should I help this person? Because he was trying to wash his hands. And I thought to myself, it's nice to help a person who might need help. But then I also thought to myself, this person, if I help him, that's me also telling him, you can't do this yourself implicitly in that. So I think that's what this is kind of touching on, at least to me. It's called my like, like if I hold the door open for a woman, in some way, it's chivalry. I mean, who would argue that, okay? But on the other level, it's also somehow saying, I don't know, I'm reaching here, that somehow I'm guessing that it, it somehow says that, according to this study at least, that, that you're saying that the woman can't do it themselves because it's, it's a detrimental to women's advancement, okay? Um, so... Let's read a little here. Um, I'm one of those women uh, that other women love to hate. How oh, great. I would get along great with her. Um, I get mad when a man opens a door for me. Okay, here. Here you go. See, I, I don't, this is, this is interesting. Um, when a man opens a door for me, when I clearly don't need it. I'm not talking about holding the door when I'm behind him. I'm talking about intentionally running ahead to open the door or when he stops and waits for me to exit the room first, even though he's closer to the door. His intentions are usually for the best. Most of the time, it's just how he was taught growing up. Good men hold doors for women. Yeah, okay. Men with manners let the ladies go first. This is kind of a cultural, we understand this. Um, it all seems very harmless, sweet even, until you consider that what's really happening is reinforcing the stereotype that women are helpless. Do you agree with that? No? You don't agree with this? No. It's a very emotional stance. What do you got to say? The example she gave, I kind of agree with. You kind of agree with? Which, which example? As far as, like, uh, like, like what she said about... Um, yeah, running ahead. Yeah, that running one, ahead okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Like, well, when he lets you out, and he's obviously closer, like... Like, if you were going to the door, and I'm like... <laughs> 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 I mean, it depends on, like, if it's, like, my friend, if it's, like, somebody I don't know. Especially if it's somebody I don't know, that's, that's like... That'd be weird and creepy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, it's, like, I understand that. It okay. makes sense to me. 
if it was your friend, that's totally different. But if it was like a total stranger, it'd be like, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Javier, you had your hand up. What were you going to say? Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Let's keep, should we keep reading here? I didn't know what this article even said. I just pulled this up. Should we keep reading here? Um, it'll see, uh, and that's what's called benevolent sexism. See, that's, there it is. Uh, the term benevolent sexism was first coined by Dr. Peter Glick. I forgot that. Peter, uh, a professor at Lawrence University and Susan T. Fisk uh, from Princeton, um, who defined it as a chivalrous attitude towards women that feels favorable but is actually sexist because it casts women as weak creatures in need of men's protection. Okay, that's essentially what benevolent sexism is. Um, one time I, I uh, uh, yeah, no, I won't say that. Uh, typically when, when we think of sexism, no, oh, I'll tell you later. One time so, someone, <laughs> so, so, uh, this, this, this lady was, was having, um, she was doing something and um, we were just talking about feminism and all this kind of stuff, and she was doing something, and she was like, C -c 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 can you give me a hand? And I was like, you're a strong, independent woman. You can do it yourself. <laughs> I know, I'm a jerk. Yeah. I'm a real jerk. Yeah, she stopped talking. She got upset. <laughs> uh, typically when we think of sex, but, but I like that. That's how I dialogue. I get people to, I want to push people a little bit. It's like the, the bump test, the frog. I want to push people to see what they're made out of. Um, and then they slap me across the face sometimes. <laughs> Typically, when we think of sexism, we think of hostile sexism, which is what we most people know it as, uh, which is described as an antagonistic attitude towards women who are often viewed as trying to control men through feminist ideology or sexual seduction. Uh, benevolent sexism feels much different from this run-of-the-mill misogyny because there is kindness at its core. Um, but that kindness always comes with a price. I don't know if that's true, but that kindness always comes. I don't know if that's how accurate that is always coming to the price. That's kind of an extreme statement, but um, there's nothing wrong with opening a door for someone or stepping aside for someone else in your path, but if you're doing it only because that person seems to be female, that's benevolent sexism. I hold the door open for, for pretty much anyone who's behind me. I, pretty, pretty just, I just hold it open. I don't even notice, personally. That's what I do. Yeah. I notice, like, say, because I take the bus here. Okay. The bus is packed. You give your seat to a woman, they don't say no, that's sexism. Like, That's true. <laughs> yeah, they would never do that. <laughs> you you uh, jerk, how dare you <laughs> offer your seat to me? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's a nice gesture, right? Of course, of course. But 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 this says something though, doesn't it? What if it was a, what if it was not a woman? What if it was a disabled person? Because last time I said that how women are disabled people are put in the same category. So what if it was a disabled person who was trying to get on a bus? and was struggling a little bit, would you, because I also teach a disabilities class, would you step in and be like, here, let me help you, let me do this for you? Or would you kindly wait and say, this person can do it themselves, I'm gonna stand here and just be patient. But then you could just be like, someone might walk by and be like, how come you're not helping that person, you, you monster? <laughs> Okay, okay, do you need, that's what I did when I was in the public library when I saw the guy. I said, do you need assistance? And he said yes, and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. Um, I felt a little weird. Why? Not asking him, but, but like I felt uncomfortable because I wanted to help him right away. That's what I wanted to do immediately. That's what I immediately wanted to do. But then I immediately stopped myself and I said, I'm also giving the message that he couldn't possibly do this on his own. That's, but but that's that's exactly what the disability rights perspective, the whole, entire disability rights perspective is based on this. Well, and that's why I stopped. Because I was on my way home from campus today, mm -hmm. and an old man, he had like the, the walk, he yeah. was getting off the bus, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there was a lady that was talking to me, so my attention was listening to what she said. Uh -huh. He looked at me, he, he pointed to the walk, I said, oh, no problem, and I helped him off the bus. Yeah, that's so good. He was basically saying... Help me out. Help me out. Yeah. He asked for help. Yeah. That's different, though. That's him no, asking saying, you. But what I'm saying is, is, is that, I mean, if you grew up in a, in a society where you respect your oldest, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. expected of you. That's not, you can't look at it like I agree. People, I'm with you on that. I'm, I, mean, I totally it's, understand. Maybe in this day and age, it's looked at as bad. Well, it's gotten but, bad, yeah. But coming from an older generation, it was looked at as supposed That's to what you to normally just naturally do. Correct. Yeah, they, they right. Them, right. Them, so. so then does this study just like sound like a bunch of bogus nonsense then? Yes. To me. Yeah? Okay, well, you had your hand up, Dana. What are you going to say? Okay, it'll come back to you maybe.
Yeah, yeah. It, there's something there. What do you What do you got to say? With nada, right? Yeah. Okay. It's being like too personal. I mean, too personal? Yeah. How so? Like, So if you had to summarize that perspective, even if you disagree with it, what do you think they're saying, though? Um, I can do what I, I can do. Basically, I can do it myself, and I don't want to help. That's what they're saying, right. Yeah, okay, as long as you understood. I can okay. it, if anything. But I mean, it's not something okay. that's not like you jerk. Yeah. Imagine someone holds the door, you punch him in the face. <laughs> don't ever do that again. <laughs> no, please don't do that, obviously. Yes, Dana. Okay. Okay, everything all right? You look like you're about to pass out. You sure? Okay. Um, is it... That's what... Okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, Okay, um, so getting back to this, okay? This might be a little So when the guy opens the door, right? Yeah. And you walk in front of him, he can check your backside. And then... Okay, <laughs> that, that's true. And another thing is, you know, you're in front of him, so he's behind you, you don't see what he's doing, you can just... I, I suppose that could happen. Very unlikely, exactly. <laughs> extremely unlikely. It almost never happens. Let's, 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 but, but, yeah. But I guess that could happen. I, I don't think you should fear that, generally. Um, all right. Um, so let's uh, let's go on. So what are what are some things that 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 uh, that men find attractive? Uh, what are these basically cues to? Again, what are they cues for? Health. Health, yeah, Verti uh, vitality, vir uh, virility, ba basically having children, uh, health. Um, so um, let's see, where did we, we leave off? Um, so we're talking a little bit about uh, physiological responses. So if you're in love with somebody and uh, they, they show um, a, a picture of, um, well, uh, let, me, let me start again. A male in an MRI machine is shown attractive faces, and they show this response in the nucleus accumbens, which is the part of the brain that is the reward pathway, the dopamine pathway. So if you see an attractive face, which is basically the button nose and the, the kind of um, Pocahontas kind of look, um, the nucleus accumbens lights up. We talked about this, though, right? We briefly mentioned this. Um, so body fat, uh, we, we were talking a little bit about this, and I think we, we slowly left off here. Um, so uh, this is where uh, the ecology, this is how uh, evolutionary psychology is erroneously kind of castigated for being very genetically deterministic. But this is an example where the context actually matters. The environment does matter. Um, so there are some cultures uh, where, and I think we, we, we did talk about this too, right? There are some cultures where females are regarded as attractive who are slightly larger than in other cultures, and there's something that mediates this. What was it? It's right up there. Yeah. Yeah, it's the abundance of food in that area. So in, in ecologies, you know what ecologies, the land, basically where we're talking about, um, where food is scarce, plump women are, are viewed as more attractive. In ecologies like the U.S. where food is abundant, the relationship is reversed. Now, this doesn't say anything at all about what you as individuals ought to prefer. This says nothing about that at all. If you have a preference, that's your preference. That's all that means. But these are just based on averages. Um, yeah. But that is like a like an adaption, though, right? Because it the is. Only reason that it, exactly. People, the only reason that the people like the battered women is because that signifies more resources. There's more resources. It's an, absolutely an adaptation, 100%. It's still adaptive. So we say that there's an environmental factor. There is, but there's always also a genetic biological factor as well in there too. Um, so in the U.S., both males and females view the female body that was thinnest to be ideal. Um, however, 
when asked uh, which was preferred, both males and females chose the more average looking figure. Um, we talked about this and how this has implications for eating disorders and whatnot. Basically, when women think that men want a thinner body than women do, um, then women can go to extremes and, and go excessively diet and whatnot. And I think we stopped right here. Yes, this is where we stopped, I think. Um, so after puberty, females' waist-to-hip ratios become significantly smaller than males. Before puberty, you look at young boys and young girls, and they look like kind of stick figures. They're just straight. And then at some point around puberty, um, the, uh, 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 the hormones go through, and the waist kind of gets a little narrow. Fat deposits move around, and, and this is where body shapes start emerging. Um, so waist-to-hip ratio, a low waist-to-hip ratio is, is, ad, is adaptive generally because uh, it, it's um, married women with a higher waist-to-hip ratio have a difficult time getting pregnant. Uh, lower waist-to-hip ratio is actually better in, in terms of miscarriage. Uh, so, so a lower waist-to-hip ratio shows that women with a lower waist-to-hip ratio tend to have fewer miscarriages. Um, which is also an adaptive uh, benefit there. Um, also, a lower waist-to-hip ratio is correlated with um, uh, less diabetes, hypertension, heart attack. Um, there's many things. We live in an era, I have a friend on Facebook who, uh, um, I met him when he first came to New York four years ago from Iraq. And when he came here, he was like a stick figure, like gaunt, like you could see his, like, ribs, okay? And now four years later, and he's about 20 years younger than me, he weighs about 70 pounds more than I do now, okay? He is, he's a big dude now. Um, and he posted on Facebook just today, he said, I have very ser serious case of sleep apnea. And I said, you know, you know what that's about, buddy. <laughs> and, uh, and then he laughed. Um, so, uh, so we live in, a, in an era where this isn't about fat shaming. I say if, if you're attracted to a certain shape, that's what you're attracted to. And that, that, that's, 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 that's even many people are, are you know, look beyond the, 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 the shape of a person and go about, you know, whether the person is kind or nice or trustworthy. These things matter to us more. Uh, but our ancestors had a different set of problems to solve. So they had to prefer people who would provide some kind of benefit um, to their, their uh, fitness. Um, so uh, males' uh, preference for a low waist-to-hip ratio has been found in the U.S., U.K., Australia, Germany, India, Cameroon, uh, even Samoa, New Zealand. And you might say Samoa, they have one of the highest rates of obesity, uh, higher than the United States, actually. And so in there, in those islands with, uh, that we see men preferring larger women, those women, even on those islands... Um, that men prefer more, they're usually still the, the thinner ones of the larger women there. Um, so males who use a short-term mating strategy, and this is, this is key here, um, if you're looking for, if men are looking for miss right now, the waist-to-hip ratio um, is, is, is not as important. If males are looking for, uh, or excuse me, it's, it's, it, it, sorry, I said that backward, it is important. They're looking for someone who... Uh, might appeal to their sensibilities where they can impregnate and then maybe go on somewhere else. Um, but someone looking for a long-term mating strategy, a male looking for a long-term mating strategy, um, it might not matter as much, the waist-to-hip ratio. So if someone wants to get married to someone and that person is someone they want to spend the rest of their life with, their waist-to-hip ratio is clearly not going to be a, a major factor. Dana, yeah. I don't think so. No, I doubt it. I don't know much about that, though. Um, so, um, but there's some anomalies. Uh, in Peru and the, the Hadza of Tanzania, uh, these women there, they were found, they did studies. They asked the men, what do you prefer? And the men in these places preferred much larger women than we typically think. Um, but when they, they, they looked at this carefully, they, they made some mistakes there. Um, they, they asked these women um, what you prefer using drawings of, of, of men. And then when they changed these uh, drawings to photographs, they got answers that were more in line with, with, um, with results around the world. But also, um, again, there were some ecological factors here that even though, yes, in these islands, some of the larger women were preferred, 
um, of those women, uh, men still preferred, most of the women were larger on these islands, but of those women that men preferred, they preferred the women with the lower waist-to-hip ratio, um, even in those islands. They just were larger waist-to-hip ratios than you would see in other parts of the world. That's, that's what it is. And that's because there's some ecological reasons. There's not a lot of food on those islands. Um, so so it, it, it helps to, to, to eat more there. Um, so that will be a sign of, of, of health. Um, but these are anomalies, and these are just guesses why, why those anomalies exist. It doesn't refute the preponderance of all of the other information that's out there. Um, so everywhere you go in the world, you see these strong preferences existing, with the exception of, of a few several islands. But even there, there's some, there's some ecological and methodological issues that might exist to explain that. But again, we're not 100% sure. Culture is something we're going to look at when we talk about cultural evolution. Uh, in the last section of this class. Cultural evolution is different than biological evolution, um, but they're connected in, in, in kind of a strange way. Um, so one other thing that um, I think I skipped over a couple things here. Um, yeah. Um, no, not yet. Okay. So Women with so is it is it waist to hip ratio that that is a good index, um, or is it body mass index that they're looking at here? So we know that males prefer women with lower waist to hip ratios, um, but some researchers started looking at body mass index. So basically, uh, 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 fat deposits essentially is what it is. Um, so which is it? Um, is, it, is it body mass index or waist to hip ratio? There's some studies that show that it might be body mass index and not waist to hip ratio. But basically the, the, the verdict is that it, it could be one or the other and we're not sure. So, so that's, that's kind of, that's, we don't really know. Some people say it might not have anything to do with waste and it might have to do more with where fat deposits are. Um, Someone told me that uh, uh, a lot of evolutionary psychology is pseudoscience, and all this stuff is just is just nonsense. Um, it it's hard to get into that right now, but a lot of it does sound a little bit like um, like you're putting the cart before the horse. But a lot of this has a lot of methodology to it that, that's uh, verified and has been replicated in many different contexts. The research is is, is quite good here, um, but that. Basically, there's, there's, we need more research on this. We don't know. Is it body mass index or waist hip ratio? We're unsure right now. I think it probably has more to do with waist hip ratio, but it's anyone's guess at the current moment. Um, so there's some trends here. Uh, so basically, males put a greater emphasis on looks than females do. Women do like looks a lot. But when they, when they look at the preferences of men and women, males might prefer looks as, as, as one of the key criteria slightly more important than women place looks, slightly more, not much more. It's one of the top things for women, too, but it might be slightly more when they're looking at tons of countries. Um, but over the years, the importance of attractiveness has, has increased. Uh, males went from 1.5 to 2.11, and females went from uh, 0.94 to 1.67. Um, so it looks like it looks like women over time have been expressing greater interest in physical looks, and that could be uh, a methodological artifact. It might be that some women feel as though they can't answer the questions honestly. So it's hard to know for sure exactly what's going on here. Obviously, women do prefer good-looking males to non-good-looking males, but it seems males might have that preference slightly stronger than women do. It's slightly, but it's, it's a little bit more. It's not much more, but it's just a little bit more. Um, but despite these cultural trends over time that have changed, uh, it's, it, it was right around, it seems like it was right around the invention of the birth control pill or thereabouts. Um, these, these trends, they, they do exist. Uh, pretty much anywhere you look in almost any country, men report at least. It's, it's self-reported, so that's, that's, that could be one methodological complication here. But men, regardless of, of the, the many countries, I think there's 42 or 39 countries in here, um, they report good looks to be more important than women do, just slightly more important. Again, it could be that women 
are unsure of what to, to put there. They might feel intimidated or something like that. But on the other hand, they might not because it's no one is no one is judging them for this. So it's hard to really know. Um, but it seems like a, a rather consistent finding that they, they found. Women do prefer good looks, um, but, but men are more likely to find it is indispensable compared to, to women. Um, so is there evidence that men have a preference for ovulating women? So here we're going back to the chimpanzees. If you are a male, so let's look at, let's look at animals for a second there. If you're talking about dogs or cats or zebras or horses or whatever, um, there's virtually no time in the animal kingdom where a female goes up to a male, a female who's not in heat, that is, and just goes up to a male and just says, let's have sex. It almost never happens. It just doesn't really happen. When a female, an animal, is receptive and is in heat, as they say, that's when you typically see the female approaching the male. Female animals almost never approach male animals for sex, with the exception of bonobos. Okay? So, so we like to look at an example and say that, well, bonobo females go up to males and have sex with them, which they do all the time. Um, but this doesn't explain the overwhelming majority of the information. Female animals do not approach males in nature and say, hey, let's get it on, unless they're in heat. Okay? If they're in heat, then they do. Um, so uh, chimpanzees, you could look at uh, the, the, the genitals, and you can see, because they have an estrous cycle rather than menstrual cycle, you can see the, the ovulation, the, uh, the ovulatory uh, um, uh, uh, period, um, just from external cues, just by simply visually looking. Um, so what that would mean is that these chimps, these male chimps who wanted to have a partner, they would have to find a female who was ovulating. And it was easy to see that for the chimp. You could see when that was. So what that would mean, that that chimp would pretty much most of the times not even approach a female who was not ovulating. And many times they do. They largely avoid those, those females. When the female chimp is ovulating, that's when many of the chimps will try to compete with each other and approach the female. Um, humans are different because we have a menstrual... We, females have a... <laughs> I have a menstrual cycle. I don't have a menstrual cycle. Um, female, human females have a menstrual cycle, so they have what's called cryptic ovulation. Um, so uh, instead of human males... Human males, they couldn't rely on external cues. They couldn't rely and they couldn't say, well, there's, there's an external cue, this, this woman is ovulating, so then I'll, I'll approach and try to impregnate her. There, there's no external cue. So what would the, the male have to do? What would the, the human male have to do? They would have to be extra nice and extra kind and extra special to her throughout the entire month. <laughs> and so this was, this was an adaptive benefit to women to have what's called cryptic ovulation. The ovulation moved from being observed on the outside for chimpanzees to being moved on the inside, and we evolved this way. So this way, women would have the advantage of being able to just select the best male who is willing to invest a lot of time every single day of the month and be with her. This proved to that woman that this guy is willing to do something, not just get it on and impregnate me, but to invest for the long term. So this cryptic ovulation became something that was a benefit to women, but it became a problem for men, because now the men had no idea when was the best time to do this, okay, evolutionarily speaking. Um, so is, it, is there evidence that men have a preference for ovulating women? Um, on the surface, the answer should be no. It just doesn't make any sense. How on earth would you possibly ever know? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but the evidence, uh, uh, it flies in the face of that, believe it or not. Um, conventional wisdom says that men cannot detect this, uh, but men can. Uh, but they just don't know they can. And even you, you can't even try. Don't even try, guys. Don't even try to figure this out. Don't do it. Do not do this. But men seem to gravitate towards women who are ovulating without even realizing that they're doing it. And that's, that's kind of an unconscious mechanism. So during so there's some keys uh, that give off this, this, um, this, this period of time, no pun intended. Uh, during the ovulation, the women's skin has a glow, as we, we, we've heard that. Uh, women's skin is lighter during ovulation. Um, estrogen levels increase during this time, thereby decreasing waist-to-hip ratio. 
uh, so women might get a little bit rounder during this time period. Um, and men find women's scent to be more uh, attractive. Uh, so when women are ovulating during this time, they, they not only find the scent to be attractive, they find them to be more attractive. So study shows that this is, this is a very uh, 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 fertile period. Um, and there's many more lines of evidence, too. Um, men who smell T-shirts worn by their, uh, they, they, they got their, their girlfriends, and they uh, had them um, give them shirts to their, to their boyfriends at a time where they were ovulating and a time where they weren't ovulating. And um, men who smelled the T-shirts worn by their ovulating girlfriend uh, showed a rise in testosterone levels. Men who smelled the shirts worn by their girlfriends when they were not ovulating did not show a rise in testosterone levels. Um, again, a man could not know that. I don't know what my testosterone levels right now. I have no clue. But it's 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 it's, it's a hormone. It, it drives you. Uh, female voices tend to rise in pitch during ovulation. Okay, uh, women's face. Now that doesn't say anything by itself, but taken with all of the evidence, it says something. Um, women's faces are judged to be more attractive by both men and women during the luteal phase. There's been some research that came out just this year that may contradict seven, so that, that could be a little bit in question. Um, eight, women report feeling more desirable during this time. Women do have been observed to wear more revealing clothes uh, in singles bar, for example, during the period of ovulation compared to other times of the month. Um, ovulating women in strip clubs receive more tips, which is kind of interesting, too. Yes, how about that? <laughs> Um, ovulating women increase flirting to attractive men, but not to unattractive men. Uh, so this is all interesting stuff. So not any one of these says anything, but taken all together, there seems to be some mechanism operating at a level below our awareness. Right? All of this together, at least. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, what's called paternity uncertainty. Um, so one problem, so uh, an ancestral woman would know that she is the mother of that child, obviously. Even modern women know this. That's not a question. Um, ancestral men had no way of knowing if they were the father. Um, so what men would do, and this is where it gets very, 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 very controversial. And I could really get into some of the research, but it's, it's it would... I would need like maybe a week to prep everyone so it's to not to, to not be triggering here, um, but I'll try my hardest here. There's some bizarre, there's some uncomfortable research on this topic to say the least. Um, so when um, you might say, so an ancestral male who chose a female to have a child with, um, at that point he would they would have they would do the act, and at this point he at some point would have to leave and go find food or go hunt or do something, right? And at this point, he leaves his mate back at the camp, at the, the, the village or whatever, okay? And he goes off, meaning that an ancestral male or even a modern male can't watch their female round the clock. So what that means, now this is, a, this is long-term strategies for men. That's a problem for a man because an ancestral one especially, modern one, that's another story, but an ancestral male, if he can't be around his woman and he goes off, how does he know what his woman is doing? Could he be a cuckold? Could he have been cuckolded? And it's possible. So um, there's this problem that ancestral males had to face, this having to solve paternity uncertainty. Are they risking their life for their child, or is it? Are they risking their life for another male's child? Now, again, an ancestral male probably didn't think to themselves, "I better risk. I better ensure paternity certainty." They, they weren't thinking along these terms the way we think about it now. But there was some mechanism operating at some point. Um, so, cryptic ovulation decreases the certainty of paternity in males. So, this crypt cryptic ovulation ensured for women it was an advantage. It ensured that that male who was interested in her would have to start showing interest all month long, every day, because the chimpanzee would have external ovulation. That chimp would just find out when, when she's ovulating, have sex with her, and just leave, not have to pay attention to her at all, because you just find out when's the most fertile time to have sex, and that's when you do it. But for the female, for the female humans, men can't see that. 
So for females, this cryptic ovulation, having the ovulation go from the outside to the inside, became an advantage for women, but a disadvantage for men. So men, uh, this, is, uh, 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 this cryptic ovulation decreases the certainty of paternity. Men don't know what's going on, and they're not always around their mate. Um, have you ever seen a, um, two, two male horses see an attractive female horse, and they want to get to the female horse? What do they do? Kick each other, fight each other, bite each other, push each other, right, until one of them loses and they get to the female, right. Now, what happens when another horse, now that, that, that male horse, the top dog or whatever, is, is with his, his female horse, and what if a new horse comes into the fold and is like, hey, I'm interested in your woman? What, is, what, is the, what does the, the horse do? Does, he's like, is he, does he say, okay? No. He does not say, okay, he says, no, this is, not, this is not acceptable. This is called mate guardianship. And when we look at horses or penguins or zebra or giraffes or elephants, you see it throughout the entire animal kingdom. But when we talk about mate guardianship in humans, it gets very dicey, very dicey indeed. Um, in fact, David Buss, and if I can, I'm not going to get into it, but David Buss has one, and I haven't read the whole thing, he has one article about the hijab, which is very uh, interesting, and how the hijab is a form of mate guardianship. Um, so, and, uh, so there's some cultural component to it, uh, as well as some biological component to this. Um, and women guard their mates, too. Women guard their mates, also. Why would a woman want to guard her mate? Resources is exactly right. If that woman is with a guy and he's like interested in Sally Joe down the street over there or whatever, that woman is going to be like, uh-uh, I don't think so. Let me see your phone, right? Let me see your, right? Yeah, that's what it is. And that's exactly what the science shows this. It's, it's vigilance. That's the type of strategy that women do to monitor their males, to, 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 to guard their mates from mate poachers who want to take their man. Men do this too. They don't want other guys coming in taking their woman. It's not just humans. Giraffes, elephants, whatever. This is in the animal kingdom. No one wants their mate taken away. So you do things to prevent your mate from going away. It's kind of like you give someone a hug, and you're like, I love you, but don't go anywhere, and no one else can come in here and get you either. That's what a hug is in some ways. In some ways, love is very controlling in some ways. You want to say it's, it's beautiful and open. It is, but you just don't want to be so open that your brains fall out of your head, right? Am I right? No one wants their mate to go somewhere else. Not, not typically. I mean, some people, it could be uh, if you have a, a polyamorous relationship, this is a rather new phenomenon. It's a rather new phenomenon. Ancestral males and females might not have benefited from that. Um, but bonobos did, which is kind of interesting, that they, they, they had that, and chimpanzees did not. Um, they, they diverge off different um, ancestral lines and probably had a lot to do with the ecology, but they're not really sure. Um, so this, this problem here, this is an especially important problem for ancestral males in the Darwinian scheme of things. Males who could not detect the certainty of paternity would risk losing female parental investment, would risk investing another man's child or being a cuckold. Uh, since women could not be guarded around the clock, males had to develop strategies to ensure, uh, I spelled that wrong, paternity certainty. Sorry about that. Um, so the solution. Um, this is where it gets a little dicey. So if an ancestral male wanted to make sure that when he risks his life to go off to war or to find food, that he's doing it for his offspring, for his child, it would be in his best interest to ensure that that female was chaste before he impregnated her. That way, there could be no question that it was another man's child. It was obviously his because she hadn't had sex with anybody yet. So risking your life made sense at that point. You know that's yours. So one solution to the problem that males faced of cryptic ovulation, which is an adaptation. This is Cryptic ovulation is basically like ancestral me too. That's like the ancestral hashtag me too because they went from external ovulation to internal ovulation. The internal ovulation was a benefit to women. Because if it was on the external, then just the chimpanzee would find out when you're ovulating and then have sex with you and run off. But when the ovulation was hidden, the woman would, this was an advantage of the woman, because now the man who was really interested in her didn't know when she was ovulating, and he had to invest his time in her. 
Um, and so this was an advantage to women. But it was a disadvantage to men because, well, they didn't know what was going on. Um, so the desire of female chastity before marriage was one solution to, to solve the problem of paternity uncertainty. Um, the quest for post-marriage fidelity is also another thing. Um, but David Buss uses the phrase, uh, and he was actually quoted in um, uh, the New York Times uh, today, actually, the author of your book. He's, there's a, uh, he's quoted in there today, so he's, if you want to read, I didn't read the article yet, but he's in there. Um, he uses the phrase, and it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, and I, I don't even like even saying it, but he uses the phrase vigilance or violence. Okay? And to be clear, evolutionary psychology does not prescribe behavior, it just describes it. So when women guard their mates, according to David Buss, they're using vigilance. They're guarding it. They're saying, you know, where, where were you? Or let me see your cell phone. Or, you know, who were you with? Or weren't you at work between, you know, three and six? I called your boss and you weren't there. What's going on? What's going on? Where were you? You know, that kind of thing. And then men, unfortunately, were vigilance and violence. This is why one of them, get, when, 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 when David Buss went to um, battered women's shelters and studied uh, what the main reason why they were assaulted by their spouses. What do you think was the number one reason he found? Infidelity. That's right. Or, or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the suspicion of infidelity or, or, or known infidelity. That was the number one reason. So men are more likely to use violence to keep their mates from straying. Women are more likely to use the tactic of, of vigilance. So he uses the phrase vigilance or violence. And again, this doesn't make it okay at all. Not at all. I'm not, not, it's wrong. It's dead wrong. But that's, we're describing, not prescribing. Does everyone understand that? I want to be very clear about that. A description does not mean a prescription, right? Dana, did you have your... Right. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, same idea. Um, so men value chaste women, or have valued chaste women in the past more so, um, because a chaste woman would, if he impregnated her, he would know that that's his kid. It couldn't have been someone else's because she hasn't had sex yet. Um, but women wouldn't care if their ancestral women, at least, wouldn't care as much if their man had many partners because... Big deal, as long as I'm getting the money, that's okay, you know? Um, which was interesting when we did this study. It seemed like the women preferred chastity in men more so than, than women, than, than men did. Isn't that kind of weird? What was up with that? Okay, I don't want to know. It's, didn't it seem like that? I don't know. Okay. Um, so failure to prefer chast women um, or, or find post-marriage fidelity could lead a man to be a cuckold. Um, so despite the importance of this, men have valued this less over time. That's crucial. And it seems to be right when the uh, birth control pill was invented in the United States. Men have valued chastity less and less and less over time. Uh, females typically do not value virgin grooms to the degree males value virgin brides, although in this classroom it seemed to be reversed, which is really strange. I, that's small sample size. I'm tacking it up to that. I don't know. That's a strange thing. Um, but maybe there's a trend that this is that we don't know about. I don't know. It's hard to say. Maybe that could change over time. Maybe women will prefer men who don't have a lot of sex partners, and men over time will prefer women who do have many sex partners. I don't know what how that would happen, but it does seem like it. It almost does. It does kind of a little seem like it a little bit. I don't know though. But I mean, anyway. So this is kind of interesting. So. Um, uh, uh, pretty much across the board uh, here, um, uh, males value chastity a little bit more than females, where in China it seems to be about equal. But in Sweden, it seems like nobody cares at all. What's going on in Sweden? And, and the USA a little bit, but what's going on in Sweden? Why doesn't anyone care about chastity in Sweden? A lot of just fun... So they have the uh, Sweden is a pretty progressive country. It's a very progressive country. So if, if a, a woman in Sweden has had twenty sexual partners, many people don't really people are marrying later, or if not at all, um, they're having fewer children. Um, I don't know what it is with Sweden, but in Sweden and the U.S., uh, men are valuing valuing chastity less and less. Uh, um, 
So to males, virginity is a cue to future fidelity. It turns out, it turns out, studies show, and it's been replicated numerous times, if a partner, and it doesn't matter, male or female, this is an average, has more sexual partners, there's a chance of you guys breaking up. It goes up higher the more sexual partners a person has. It goes up higher for men or women. Um, but again, you can't use that number to predict what an individual would do. So don't do that. If you know someone where everything is great and they had 700 partners, someone put it on Twitter that they, they, they had, she, she, did you see this? She had like 3,000 or 2,000, like a, it was like a really high number, it was a very high number of sexual partners. So that's, that's their thing. That's what someone does. Was she a pill Was she a pill No. No. I mean, not that I know of. Maybe she, I don't know. I don't know. I shouldn't say. I'm not sure. No, it was on Twitter. It was on Twitter. I don't know. Live, <laughs> she was definitely living life. She's busy. She's busy for sure. <sighs> Seems like a lot of time. But anyway. Um, so people who have many sexual partners before marriage are more likely to be unfaithful. That doesn't mean that I, this... So if you use... There's something called the is-ought problem. Uh, I don't have chalk here. Um, so just because something is doesn't mean that it ought to be. In other words, just because people who have more sexual partners are more likely to get divorced, it doesn't mean that you should then find a partner who has fewer sexual partners because you can't use these averages to understand individuals. So just be clear about that. But these are solid numbers here. Um, to males, unfaithfulness in his spouse has been measured to be more painful to him than, than other harm his partner could inflict. They've even compared this to an electric shock. Uh, that the that the the woman would deliver to him. Um, there's almost nothing more painful to most men than hearing their female had sex. Um, but when women hear that their men had sex outside of their relationship, although they are upset, obviously they they seem to be less upset than men are about this. Women tend to get more upset on average about what do you think they get more upset than men do. Yeah, emotional fidelity, infidelity, that's exactly right. When women feel that their man is not paying attention to them or is spending more time with another woman, that is, that's, there's a problem there now. That's, that's a no-no. Um, women really don't like that, but you ask guys, like, well, that, she's hanging out with, with that dude down the hallway. Who cares? She's coming home with me. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Um, on average, yeah, yeah, right, he's right. These are averages. These are averages. You can't know an individual based on these averages, but on average, on average. Uh, so to, to males, unfaithfulness is, is just one of the worst things to them. Um, okay, so we don't talk about homosexuality too much in here because from an ancestral point of view, homosexuality should not have even evolved in some ways because gay people typically have fewer children than straight people do by definition. Um, and yet, it still exists, and it's not a choice, like some people might say. There's a biological component. I mean, obviously, it's a choice. You don't not choose to have sex with someone unless there's an assault. I mean, of course, there's a social component to it, but there is a biological component to it, um, just like there's a biological component to heterosexuality. There's a biological component to homosexuality, too, and it's the same kind of thing. Um, where does it come from? It's like baldness. If baldness, if women don't prefer men who are bald, why does baldness exist? Shouldn't it have disappeared at some point? Homosexuals typically don't have kids. Then why are gay genes, quote unquote gay genes, being passed on if gay people typically don't have children? And the answer pretty much comes down to W.V. Hamilton's theory of inclusive fitness, basically. Um, so they tested this with men and women. Basically, the short version of the story is that this theory works for women, for gay women, but not for gay guys, and they don't know why. They have no idea why. Basically, they found that a gay brother doesn't have a straight brother who has more children, but a gay sister does have a gay a straight sister who does have more children, and they don't know why that is. Uh, it seems to have something to do um, with with women helping each other, but maybe men being less apt to do so, but they, they don't know why that is. Um, yeah, Dana. 
For what? Include for what? I didn't hear you. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So if the sister, if the gay sister, didn't give birth to the child, she she might still be more likely to help her sister than a gay guy would helping his straight brother with the children he had. Exactly why, we don't know. But we don't see gay guys um, having brothers who have more kids. But we do see gay women having their straight sisters have more children. But we don't know why that is. And if their genes are being passed on with their... Because their, if their, their sister has a kid, that's part of their genome going in the future too. We don't know exactly why this is. Um, so the kin altruism theory, um, the individuals offset the cost of reproduction by investing in genetics relative offspring. Um, this, this seems to, again, not really work for men, but it seems to work for women. And they, they call that the female fertility hypothesis, uh, which suggests that genes for male homosexuality can evolve if they produce an increased reproductive rate in the female relatives um, of male homosexuals there's some, there's some varying degrees and interpretations of this. I'm not going to get into detail. Basically, what I want you to know is that the female fertility hypothesis might be the correct one, but they're not even sure about that. Um, the other explanation uh, is, um, so, so indeed, maternal female relatives of gay males uh, produce more offspring. So in other words, um, I, I, I think I may have actually said that a little bit backward. Um, whenever, there's, when, whenever there's a female involved in helping a gay met family member pass their genes on, it seems they seem to have more children. But when there's a, a, a gay, a straight person helping a gay guy help get more kids, that seems to not be the case. They seem to not have as many kids. But they don't know exactly why. I mean, straight male health. Did I say that backwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm saying it backwards. Straight, no, no, you said it. You just said straight person, but wouldn't that mean straight male? Yeah, that's okay. what I meant. That's what I meant. Um, so another theory uh, proposes that we should focus on the functions of homoerotic behavior per se uh, rather than sexual orientation. Um, and there's something called the alliance formation theory. There's no good evidence that supports this. So some people say that... Um, that, that the gay gene gets, or there's no gay gene, but the gay set of, of biological responses or whatever gets transmitted because, this is where it gets kind of dicey, older men have sexual relationships with young boys, and this somehow facilitates some promulgation of genetic material into the future. It's kind of bogus. It's just, it's just the evidence is almost non-existent for it. Um, but there is some anthropological evidence, and again, I was talking about the Catholic Church before and this, this uh, the sexual abuse. Um, we hear about this in the Catholic Church, but this kind of thing of um, having sex with, uh, with, with children, essentially, is not limited to just Catholicism. Um, this is the Sambia tribe in Papua New Guinea, um, and he, that boy there, is not practicing um, an in, uh, a musical instrument. Um, he's practicing how to perform fellatio, uh, which is which is a, what we colloquially call a blowjob. Uh, and um, in the Sambia, they believe that ingesting the semen gives a person strength and power, and they get strong, and that's how they become fierce warriors. Um, we all we can also look at other uh, uh, lines of evidence that show that there is what we would call pedophilia in Western culture seen in other cultures, and it's seen as being normal, if you could call it that, in other cultures. It, it's, it's not normal in our culture, but in other cultures it is. And that's where we get into the problem of, of relativism. If we want to revere other cultures and say everyone does things the way they do, but they're doing something that is so wrong to us, how do we say, well, that's okay because you do it in your culture. That's fine. Um, and, and in some ways, we shouldn't tell other people what to do because it's their culture. But what we're seeing now is that there's no group of people who aren't in contact with each other now, whereas just about a century ago, there were a lot. Now, these cultures that were separate are now in touch with each other. Yeah.
outside the U.S. and not what they want to do and help those that's the idea, hopefully. Yeah, exactly, hopefully. Yeah, so if, if, if this is... Now, now, these boys in the Sambian culture don't actually suffer, believe it or not. That's part of their tribe. It's a ritual. In fact, if they didn't do this, those boys might be like the black sheep of the tribe. You didn't do that, or they might even make fun of them or something like this. Um, the, the husbands and wives basically push the young boys out of the hut to go do this. They're like, you got to go. you got to go do this. This is your time. It's, it's like the bar mitzvah, basically. It's a rite of passage. It's a, it's a ritual. Um, so now we say that, but what happens if your neighbor was doing this? It would be a little strange, to say the least. Right? Be unusual. Yeah. We sort of talked about it, but we're not consistent. Ideas do come to America, like they come to live here and they're still practicing. I missed that last part. When they come to America and they practice these things that we come to the people, how does that go? Yeah, how does it go? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, what if someone um, comes from a part of the world where it's okay to have multiple wives, but they come to uh, a country where that is against the law? Now there's a question of religious freedom versus uh, American laws. And this is, this is it's a very complex topic. Um, it's, it's so complex, uh, and it goes down to something like um, female uh, genital cutting, for example is something that is done in, in some cultures. Um, and some people from those cultures would come to America and the parents would want to do that for their daughters. And they were doing it, but then they were taking their daughters back to the Middle East or to Africa to have it done. And um, uh, they were getting sick and they were getting like um, sores and, what, and, and infections because they, they didn't have proper, it wasn't clean, yeah, right. And so the, the, the American um, Pediatric Association in 2009 said that um, it's okay, they issued a statement that a, a ceremonial nick on the clitoris is acceptable to do. Um, but then they got a lot of heat for it. They got a lot of heat because then they're saying that it's okay to cut a, young, a, a, ba a, a girl's genitals. And then a lot of people in America, they were saying, that's not cool. You can't do that. And then like a week later, the American Pediatric Association, they were like, um, we changed our mind. We're going to go back to that. So how cultures interact with one another, this is, this is an example of cultural evolution. This isn't biological evolution. This is cultural evolution. Um, and they're, they're definitely connected to each other. And we'll talk a lot more about this next week. Um, have a good one. Have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, is there a sign-in sheet? Uh, anywhere there? Okay. Thanks. Uh, make sure you get your name on the sign of sheet. Um, uh, I don't have them with me. No, no. I'm just asking. Um, I'm not going to give them back, but you, John, right? Yes. Um, just make sure that you, you did hand Because I, mean, I gave you all six of them. You, yeah, you, you gave last time you gave Right. Yeah. But are you still counting the six ones? Though? Because I know you said that it's You gave me six with it? I gave you four, five, and six. Yeah. I didn't check well, it off something, yet, but if you gave it to me, I like can give you six back. Yeah. Um, I'd rather, honestly, I'd rather you keep it. Then I'll, I'll keep it. Right. Yeah. I'll what keep about, it. what's the grading criteria for um, for the first draft? Is it the same way where it's P or F? I'm going to put, I'm going to post something tonight. Okay. With like a criteria, everything? Yeah, it's, it's thing. basically going to be like, um, I just want you to cite your sources and, and you can have your opinion, but just right. back it up and show where you got it. Right, no and if you do that, that's, you'll have maximum. No problem. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. You too.